Thurnley Abbey by Percival Landon Three years ago, I was on my way out to the east. And as an extra day in London was of some importance, I took the Friday evening mail train to Brindisi instead of the usual Thursday morning Marseille Express. Many people shrink from the long 48-hour train journey through Europe and the subsequent rush across the Mediterranean on the 19-knot Isis or the Osiris. But there's really very little discomfort on either the train or the mailboat, and unless there's actually nothing for me to do, I always like to save the extra day and a half in London, before I say goodbye to her, for one of my longer tramps. This time, it was early, I remember, in the shipping season, probably about the beginning of September, there were few passengers, and I had a compartment in the P&O Indian Express to myself all the way from Calais. All Sunday I watched the blue waves dimpling the Adriatic, and the pale rosemary along the cuttings, the plain white towns with their flat roofs and their bold duomos, and the grey-green gnarled olive orchards of Apulia. The journey was just like any other. We ate in the dining car as often and as long as we decently could. We slept after luncheon. We dawdled the afternoon away with yellow-backed novels. Sometimes we exchanged platitudes in the smoking room. And it was there that I met Alistair Colvin. Colvin was a man of middle height with a resolute, well-cut jaw. His hair was turning grey, his moustache was sun-whitened, otherwise he was clean-shaven. Obviously a gentleman, and obviously also a preoccupied man. He had no great wit. When spoken to, he made the usual remarks in the right way, and I dare say he refrained from banalities, only because he spoke less than the rest of us, most of the time he buried himself in the Wagon Lee Company's timetable, but seemed unable to concentrate his attention on any one page of it. He found that I'd been over the Siberian Railway, and for a quarter of an hour he discussed it with me. Then he lost interest and rose to go to his compartment, but came back again very soon, and seemed glad to pick up the conversation again. Of course, this didn't seem to me to be of any importance— most travellers by train become a trifle infirm of purpose after thirty-six hours rattling. But Colvin's restless way I noticed in a somewhat marked contrast with a man's personal importance and dignity. Especially ill-suited was it to his finely made large hand with strong, broad, regular nails and its few lines. As I looked at his hand I noticed a long, deep and recent scar of ragged shape, However, it is absurd to pretend that I thought anything was unusual. I went off at five o'clock on Sunday afternoon to sleep away the hour or two that had still to be got through before we arrived at Brindisi. Once there, we few passengers transhipped our hand baggage, verified our berths, there were only a score of us in all, and then, after an aimless ramble of half an hour in Brindisi, we returned to dinner at the Hotel International not wholly surprised that the town had been the death of Virgil. If I remember rightly, there's a gaily painted hall at the International. I do not wish to advertise anything, but there is no other place in Brindisi at which to await the coming of the mails, and after dinner I was looking with awe at a trellis overgrown with blue vines, when Colvin moved across the room to my table. He picked up Il Secolo, but almost immediately gave up the pretense of reading it. He turned squarely to me and said, would you do me a favour? One doesn't do favours to stray acquaintances on Continental Expresses without knowing something more of them than I knew of Colvin. But I smiled in a non-committal way and asked him what he wanted. I wasn't wrong in part of my estimate of him. He said bluntly, Will you let me sleep in your cabin on the Osiris? And he coloured a little as he said it. Now, there is nothing more tiresome than having to put up with a stable companion at sea, and I asked him rather pointedly, "'Surely there's room for us all?' I thought that perhaps he'd been partnered with some mangy Levantine and wanted to escape from him at all hazards. Colvin, still somewhat confused, said, "'Yes, I'm in a cabin by myself, but you would do me the greatest favour if you would allow me to share yours.' This was all very well, but besides the fact that I always sleep better alone, there'd been some recent thefts on board these boats.' and I hesitated, frank and honest and self-conscious as Colvin was. Just then the mail train came in with a clatter and a rush of escaping steam, and I asked him to see me again about it on the boat when we started. He answered me curtly. I suppose he saw the mistrust in my manner. I'm a member of White's and the Beefsteak, 
I smiled to myself as he said it, but I remembered in a moment that the man, if he were really what he claimed to be, and I make no doubt that he was, must have been sorely put to it, before he urged the fact as a guarantee of his respectability to a total stranger at a Brindisi hotel. That evening, as we cleared the red and green harbour lights of Brindisi, Colvin explained. This is the story, in his own words. When I was travelling in India some years ago, I made the acquaintance of a youngish man in the woods and forests. We camped out together for a week, and I found him a pleasant companion. John Broughton was a light-hearted soul when off duty, but a steady and capable man in any of the small emergencies that continually arise in that department. He was liked and trusted by the natives, and his future was well assured in government service when a fair-sized estate was unexpectedly left to him and he joyfully shook the dust of the Indian plains from his feet and returned to England. For five years he drifted about London. I saw him now and then. We dined together about every eighteen months, and I could trace pretty exactly the gradual sickening of Broughton with a merely idle life. He then set out on a couple of long voyages, returned as restless as before, and at last told me that he decided to marry and settle down at his place, Thurnley Abbey, which had long been empty. He spoke about looking after the property and standing for his constituency in the usual way. He was quite happy and full of information about his future. Among other things, I asked him about Thurnley Abbey. He confessed that he hardly knew the place. The last tenant, a man called Clark, had lived in one wing for fifteen years and seen no one. He'd been a miser and a hermit. It was the rarest thing for a light to be seen at the Abbey after dark. Only the barest necessities of life were ordered, and the tenant himself received them at the side door. His one half-caste manservant, after a month's stay in the house, had abruptly left without warning and returned to the southern states. One thing Broughton complained bitterly about, Clark had willfully spread the rumour among the villagers that the abbey was haunted, and had even condescended to play childish tricks with spirit lamps and salt in order to scare trespassers away at night. He'd been detected in the act of tomfoolery, but the story spread, and no one, said Broughton, would venture near the house except in broad daylight. The hauntedness of Thurnley Abbey was now, he said with a grin, part of the gospel of the countryside, but he and his young wife were going to change all that. Would I propose myself at any time I liked? I, of course, said I would, and equally, of course, intended to do nothing of the sort without a definite invitation." The house was put in thorough repair, though not a stick of the old furniture and tapestry were removed. Floors and ceilings were relayed, the roof was made watertight again, and the dust of half a century was scoured out. He showed me some photographs of the place. It was called an abbey, though as a matter of fact it had only been the infirmary of the long-vanished Abbey of Kloster some five miles away. The larger part of this building remained as it had in pre-Reformation days but a wing had been added in Jacobean times, and that part of the house had been kept in something like repair by Mr. Clark. He had in both the ground and the first floors set a heavy timber door, strongly barred with iron, in the passage between the earlier and the Jacobean parts of the house, and had entirely neglected the former. So there had been a good deal of work to be done. Broughton, whom I saw in London two or three times about this time, made a great deal of fun over the positive refusal of the workmen to remain after sundown. Even after the electric light had been put into every room, nothing would induce them to remain, though, as Broughton observed, electric light was death on ghosts. The legend of the Abbey's ghosts had gone far and wide, and the men would take no risks. On the whole, though nothing of any sort or kind had been conjured up, even by their heated imaginations during their five months' work upon the Abbey, the belief in ghosts was rather strengthened than otherwise in Thurnley because of the men's confessed nervousness, and local tradition declared itself in favour of the ghost of an immured nun. "'Good old nun,' said Broughton. I asked him whether in general he believed in the possibility of ghosts, and rather to my surprise he said that he couldn't say he entirely disbelieved in them. A man in India had told him one morning in camp that he believed that his mother was dead in England, as her vision had come to him in his tent the night before. He had not been alarmed, but had said nothing, and the figure vanished again. As a matter of fact, the next possible Dakwala brought a telegram announcing his mother's death. There the thing was, said Broughton. 
My own idea, said he, that if a ghost ever does come one's way, one ought to speak to it. I agreed. Little as I knew of the ghost world and its conventions, I'd already remembered that a spook was in honour bound to wait to be spoken to. It didn't seem much to do, and I felt that the sound of one's own voice would, at any rate, reassure oneself as to one's wakefulness. But there are few ghosts outside Europe, few, that is, that a white man can see, and I'd never been troubled with any. However, as I've said, I told Broughton that I agreed. So the wedding took place, and I went to it in a tall hat, which I'd bought for the occasion, and the new Mrs. Broughton smiled very nicely at me afterwards. As it had to happen, I took the Orient Express that evening and was not in England again for nearly six months. Just before I came back, I got a letter from Broughton. He asked if I could see him in London or come to Thurnley, as he thought I should be better able to help him than anyone else he knew. His wife sent a nice message to me at the end, so I was reassured about at least one thing. I wrote from Budapest that I would come and see him at Thurnley two days after my arrival in London and as I sauntered out of the Pannonia, into the Kerepesi Ut, to post my letters, I wondered of what earthly service I could be to Broughton. I'd been out with him after Tiger, on foot, and I could imagine few men better able at a pinch to manage their own business. However, I had nothing to do, so after dealing with some small accumulations of business during my absence, I packed a kit bag and departed to Euston. I was met by a trap at Thurnley Road Station, and after a drive of nearly seven miles we echoed through the sleepy streets of Thurnley Village, into which the main gates of the park thrust themselves, splendid with pillars and spread eagles and tomcats rampant atop of them. From the gates a quadruple avenue of beech trees led inward for a quarter of a mile. Beneath them a neat strip of fine turf edged the road and ran back until the poison of the dead beech leaves had killed it under the trees. There were many wheel tracks on the road, and a comfortable little pony trap jogged past me, laden with a country parson and his wife and daughter. Evidently, there was some garden party going on at the abbey. The road dropped away to the right at the end of the avenue, and I could see the abbey across a wide pasturage and a broad lawn, thickly dotted with guests. The end of the building was plain. It must have been almost mercilessly austere when it was first built but time had crumbled the edges and toned the stone down to an orange-likened grey wherever it showed beneath its curtain of magnolia, jasmine, and ivy. Further on was the three-storied Jacobean house, plain and handsome. There hadn't been the slightest attempt to adapt the one to the other, but the kindly ivy had glossed over the touching point. There was a tall fletch in the middle of the building, surmounting a small bell tower. Behind the house there rose the mountainous verdure of Spanish chestnuts, all the way up the hill. Broughton had seen me coming from afar, and walked across from his other guests to welcome me, before turning me over to his butler's care. This man was sandy-haired, and rather inclined to be talkative. He could, however, answer hardly any questions about the house. He had, he said, only been there three weeks. Mindful of what Broughton told me, I made no inquiries about ghosts though the room into which I was shown might have justified anything. It was a very large, low room with oak beams projecting from the white ceiling. Every inch of the walls, including the doors, was covered with tapestry, and a remarkably fine Italian four-post bedstead, heavily draped, added to the darkness and dignity of the place. All the furniture was old, well-made, and dark. Underfoot there was a plain green pile carpet, the only new thing about the room, except the electric light fittings and the jugs and basins. Even the looking-glass on the dressing-table was an old pyramidal Venetian glass, set in heavy repoussé frame of tarnished silver. After a few minutes cleaning up, I went downstairs and out upon the lawn, where I greeted my hostess. The people gathered there were the usual country type, all anxious to be pleased and roundly curious as to the new master of the abbey. Rather to my surprise, and quite to my pleasure, I rediscovered Glenham, who I'd known well in old days in Barotseland. He lived quite close, as he remarked with a grin, I ought to have known. But, he added, I don't live in a place like this. He swept his hand to the long low lines of the abbey in obvious admiration, and then, to my intense interest, muttered beneath his breath, Thank God. He saw I'd overheard him, and turning to me said decidedly, Yes, thank God, I said, and I meant I wouldn't live at Thurnley Abbey for all Broughton's money. 
But surely, I demurred, you know that old Clark was discovered in the very act of setting light to his bugaboos? Glenham shrugged his shoulders. Yes, I know about that. But there's something wrong with the place still. All I can say is that Broughton is a different man since he's lived here. I don't believe that he will remain much longer. But you're staying here? Well, you'll hear all about it tonight. There's a big dinner, I understand. The conversation turned off to old reminiscences, and Glenham, soon after, had to go. Before I went to dress that evening, I had twenty minutes' talk with Broughton in his library. There was no doubt that the man was altered, gravely altered. He was nervous and fidgety, and I found him looking at me only when my eye was off him. I naturally asked him what he wanted of me. I told him I would do anything I could, but that I couldn't conceive what he lacked that I could provide. He said, with a lustreless smile, that there was, however, something, and that he would tell me the following morning. It struck me that he was somehow ashamed of himself, and perhaps ashamed of the part he was asking me to play. However, I dismissed the subject from my mind, and went up to dress in my palatial room. As I shut the door, a draught blew out the Queen of Sheba from a wall, and I noticed that the tapestries were not fastened to the wall at the bottom. I've always held very practical views about spooks, and it's often seemed to me that the slow waving in firelight of loose tapestry on a wall would account for 99% of the stories one hears. And certainly the dignified undulation of this lady with her attendants and huntsmen, one of whom was untidily cutting the throat of a fallow deer, upon the very steps of which King Solomon, a grey-faced Flemish nobleman with the Order of the Golden Fleece, awaited his fair visitor, gave colour to my hypothesis. Nothing much happened at dinner. The people were very much like those of the garden party. After the ladies had gone, I found myself talking to the rural dean. He was a thin, earnest man, who at once turned the conversation to old Clark's buffooneries. But, he said, Mr. Broughton had introduced such a new and cheerful spirit, not only into the abbey, but, you might say, into the whole neighbourhood, that he had great hopes that the ignorant superstitions of the past were from henceforth destined to oblivion. Thereupon his other neighbour, a portly gentleman of independent means and position, audibly remarked, Amen, which damped the rural dean, and we talked of partridges past, partridges present, and pheasants to come. At the other end of the table, Broughton sat with a couple of his friends, red-faced hunting men. Once I noticed that they were discussing me, but I paid no attention to it at the time. I remembered it a few hours later. By eleven all the guests were gone, and Broughton, his wife and I were alone together under the fine plaster ceiling of the Jacobean drawing-room. Mrs. Broughton talked about one or two of the neighbours, and then, with a smile, said that she knew I would excuse her, shook hands with me, and went off to bed. I'm not very good at analysing things, but I felt that she talked a little uncomfortably and with a suspicion of effort, smiled rather conventionally, and was obviously glad to go. These things seemed trifling enough to repeat, but I had throughout the faint feeling that everything was not square. Under the circumstances, this was enough to set me wondering what on earth the service could be that I was to render wondering also whether the whole business was not some ill-advised jest in order to make me come down from London for a mere shooting party. Broughton said little after she'd gone, but he was evidently labouring to bring the conversation round to the so-called haunting of the Abbey. As soon as I saw this, of course, I asked him directly about it. He then seemed to lose interest in the matter. There was no doubt about it. Broughton was somehow a changed man, and to my mind he'd changed in no way for the better. Mrs. Broughton seemed no sufficient cause. He was clearly very fond of her, and she of him. I reminded him that he was going to tell me what I could do for him in the morning, pleaded my journey, lighted a candle, and went upstairs with him. At the end of the passage leading into the old house, he grinned weakly and said, Mind, if you see a ghost, do talk to it. You said you would. He stood irresolutely a moment, and then turned away. At the door of his dressing-room he paused for a moment. "'I'm here,' he called out. "'If you should want anything. Good night.' And he shut the door. I went along the passage to my room, undressed, switched on a lamp beside my bed, read a few pages of the jungle book, and then, more than ready for sleep, switched the light off, and went fast asleep. Three hours later I woke up. <laughs> 
There was not a breath of wind outside. It was so silent that my ears found employment in listening for the throbbing of the blood within them. There was not even a flicker of light from the fireplace. As I lay there, an ash tinkled slightly as it cooled, but there was hardly a gleam of the dullest red in the grate. An owl cried among the silent Spanish chestnuts on the slope outside. I idly reviewed the events of the day, hoping that I should fall off to sleep again before I reached dinner. But at the end I seemed as wakeful as ever. There was no help for it. I must read my jungle book again, till I felt ready to go off. So I fumbled for the pair at the end of the cord that hung down inside the bed, and I switched on the bedside lamp. The sudden glory dazzled me for a moment. I felt under my pillow for my book with half-shut eyes. Then, growing used to the light, I happened to look down to the foot of my bed. I can never tell you really what happened then. Nothing I could ever confess in the most abject words could even faintly picture to you what I felt. I know that my heart stopped dead and my throat shut automatically. In one instinctive movement I crouched back up against the headboards of the bed, staring at the horror. The movement set my heart going again, and the sweat dripped from every pore. I'm not a particularly religious man, but I've always believed that God would never allow any supernatural appearance to present itself to man in, in such a guise, and in such circumstances that harm, either bodily or mental, could result to him. I can only tell you that at that moment... Both my life and my reason rocked unsteadily on their seats. The other Osiris passengers had gone to bed. Only he and I remained leaning over the starboard railing, which rattled uneasily now and then under the fierce vibration of the over-engined mailboat. Far over, there were the lights of a few fishing smacks riding out the night, and a great rush of white combing and seething water fell out and away from us overside. At last... Colvin went on. Leaning over the foot of my bed, looking at me, was a figure swathed in a rotten and tattered veiling. This shroud passed over the head, but left both eyes and the right side of the face bare. It then followed the line of the arm down to where the hands grasped the bed end. The face was not that entirely of a skull, though the eyes and the flesh of the face were totally gone. There was a thin, dry skin drawn tightly over the features, and there was some skin left on the hand. One wisp of hair crossed the forehead. It was perfectly still. I looked at it, and it looked at me, and my brains turned dry and hot in my head. I'd still got the pair of the electric lamp in my hand, and I played idly with it, only I dared not turn the light out again. I shut my eyes, only to open them in a hideous terror the same second. The thing had not moved. My heart was thumping and the sweat cooled me as it evaporated. Another cinder tinkled in the grate, and a panel creaked in the wall. My reason failed me. For twenty minutes or twenty seconds I was able to think of nothing else but this awful figure, till there came, hurtling through the empty channels of my senses, the remembrance that Broughton and his friends had discussed me furtively at dinner. The dim possibility of it being a hoax, stole gratefully into my unhappy mind, and once there, one's pluck came creeping back along a thousand tiny veins. My first sensation was one of blind, unreasoning thankfulness that my brain was going to stand the trial. I'm not a timid man, but the best of us need some human handle to steady him in time of extremity, and this faint but growing hope that after all it might only be a brutal hoax, I found the fulcrum that I needed. At last I moved. How I managed to do it, I cannot tell you, but with one spring towards the foot of the bed, I got within arm's length and struck out one fearful blow with my fist at the thing. It crumpled under it, and my hand was cut to the bone. With the sickening revulsion after my terror, I dropped half-fainting across the end of the bed. So it was merely a foul trick after all. No doubt the trick had been played many times before, no doubt Broughton and his friends, and had some bet amongst themselves as to what I should do when I discovered the gruesome thing. From my state of abject terror, I found myself transported into an insensate anger. I shouted curses upon Broughton. I dived rather than climbed over the bed end onto the sofa. I tore at the robed skeleton. How well the whole thing had been carried out, I thought. I broke the skull against the floor and stamped upon its dry bones. I flung the head away under the bed.
and rent the brittle bones of the trunk in pieces. I snapped the thin thigh bones across my knee and flung them in different directions. The shin bones I set up against a stool and broke with my heel. I raged like a berserker against the loathly thing and stripped the ribs from the backbone and slung the breastbone against the cupboard. My fury increased as the work of destruction went on. I tore the frail, rotten veil into twenty pieces, and the dust went up over everything, over the clean blotting paper and the silver inkstand. At last my work was done. There was but a raffle of broken bones and strips of parchment and crumbling wool. Then, picking up a piece of the skull, it was the cheek and temple bone of the right side, I remember, I opened the door and went down the passage to Broughton's dressing room. I remember still how my sweat-dripping pyjamas clung to me as I walked. At the door I kicked and entered. Broughton was in bed. He'd already turned the light on and seemed shrunken and horrified. For a moment he could hardly pull himself together. Then I spoke. I don't know what I said. Only I know that from a heart full and overfull with hatred and contempt, spurred on by shame of my own recent cowardice, I let my tongue run on. He answered nothing. I was amazed at my own fluency. My hair still clung lankly to my wet temples, my hand was bleeding profusely, and I must have looked a strange sight. Broughton huddled himself up to the head of the bed, just as I had. Still he made no answer, no defence. He seemed preoccupied with something besides my reproaches, and once or twice moistened his lips with his tongue. But he could say nothing, though he moved his hands now and again, just as a baby who cannot speak moves his hands. At last the door into Mrs. Broughton's room opened, and she came in, white and terrified. "'What is it? What is it? Oh, in God's name, what is it?' she cried again and again, and then she went up to her husband and sat on the bed, and the two faced me in speechless terror. I told her what the matter was. I spared her husband not a word for her presence there. Yet he seemed hardly to understand. I told the pair that I had spoiled their cowardly joke for them. Broughton looked up. I've smashed the foul thing into a hundred pieces, I said. Broughton licked his lips again, and his mouth worked. By God, I shouted, it would serve you right if I thrashed you within an inch of your life. I will take care that not a decent man or woman of my acquaintance ever speaks to you again. And there, I added, throwing the broken piece of the skull upon the floor beside his bed, there is a souvenir for you of your damned work tonight. Broughton saw the bone, and in a moment it was his turn to frighten me. He squealed like a hare caught in a trap. He screamed and screamed till Mrs. Broughton, almost as terrified as I, held on to him and coaxed him like a child to be quiet. But Broughton, and as he moved I thought that ten minutes ago I perhaps looked as terribly ill as he did, thrust her from him and scrambled out of the bed onto the floor, and still screaming put out his hand to the bone. It had blood on it from my hand. He paid no attention to me whatsoever. In turn, I said nothing. This was a new turn, indeed, to the horrors of the evening. He rose from the floor with the bone in his hand and stood silent. He seemed to be listening. Time, time, perhaps, he muttered, and almost at the same moment fell at full length on the carpet, cutting his head against the fender. The bone flew from his hand and came to rest near the door. I picked Broughton up, haggard and broken with blood over his face, he whispered hoarsely and quickly, Listen, listen. We listened. After ten seconds utter quiet, I seemed to hear something. I couldn't be sure, but at last there was no doubt. There was a quiet sound as of one moving along the passage. Little regular steps came towards us over the hard oak flooring. Broughton moved to where his wife sat, white and speechless on the bed, and pressed her face into his shoulder. Then the last thing that I could see, as he turned the light out, he fell forward, with his own head pressed into the pillow of the bed. Something in their company, something in their cowardice, helped me, and I faced the open doorway of the room, which was outlined fairly clearly against the dimly lighted passage. I put out one hand and touched Mrs. Broughton's shoulder in the darkness, but at the last moment I too failed. I sank on my knees and put my face in the bed. Only we all heard... The footsteps came to the door, and there they stopped. The piece of bone was lying a yard inside the door. There was a rustle of moving stuff, and the thing was in the room. Mrs. Broughton was silent. I could hear Broughton's voice praying, muffled in the pillow. I was cursing my own cowardice. 
Then the steps moved out again on the oak boards of the passage, and I heard the sounds dying away. In a flash of remorse, I went to the door and looked out. There at the end of the corridor was a small, bowed figure in a grey veil. I knew it only too well, but this time there was a pathos in the drooped head that left me standing with my forehead bowed in shame against the jamb of the door. "'You can turn the light on,' I said, and there was an answering flare. There was no bone at my feet. Mrs. Broughton had fainted. Broughton was almost useless, and it took me ten minutes to bring her to. Broughton said only one thing worth remembering. For the most part, he went on muttering prayers. But I was glad afterwards to recollect that he'd said that thing. He said it in a colourless voice, half as a question, half as a reproach. You didn't speak to her. We spent the remainder of the night together. Mrs. Broughton actually fell off into a kind of sleep before dawn, but she suffered so horribly in her dreams that I shook her into consciousness again. Never was dawn so long in coming. Three or four times Broughton spoke to himself. Mrs. Broughton would then just tighten her hold on his arm, but she could say nothing. As for me, I can honestly say that I grew worse as the hours passed and the light strengthened. The two violent reactions had battered down my steadiness of view, and I felt that the foundations of my life had been built upon the sand. I said nothing, and after binding up my hand with a towel, I didn't move. It was better so. They helped me, and I helped them, and we all three knew that our reason had gone very near to ruin that night. At last, when the light came in pretty strongly, and the birds outside were chattering and singing, we felt that we must do something, yet we never moved. You might have thought that we should particularly dislike being found as we were by the servants. Yet nothing of the kind mattered a straw, and an overpowering listlessness bound us as we sat, until Chapman, Broughton's man, actually knocked and opened the door. None of us moved. Broughton, speaking hardly and stiffly, said, Chapman, you can come back in five minutes. Chapman was a discreet man but it would have made no difference if he'd carried his news to the servant's room at once. We looked at each other, and I said I must go back. I meant to wait outside till Chapman returned. I simply dared not re-enter my bedroom alone. Broughton roused himself and said he would come with me. Mrs. Broughton agreed to remain in her own room for five minutes, if the blinds were drawn up and all the doors were open. So Broughton and I, leaning stiffly, one against the other, went down to my room. By the morning light that filtered past the blinds we could see our way, and I released the blinds. There was nothing wrong in the room from end to end, except smears of my own blood on the bed, on the sofa, and on the carpet, where I'd torn the thing to pieces. Colvin had finished his story. There was nothing to say. Seven bells stuttered out from the forecastle, and the answering cry wailed through the darkness. I took him downstairs. Of course, I'm much better now, but it is a kindness of you to let me sleep in your cabin.